I'd like to talk to you about prevention. Big scary word, we all use it, right? We're not really sure what it means, though. Prevention is the art and process of keeping something from happening. Now, what I'd like to talk to you about is a prevention industry that we call the Human API. And essentially, the promise of this is that a predictive, collaborative, proactive environment trumps a reactive, sort of staccato approach to medicine and information. That's the basic premise. But in order to tell you that story, I'm going to tell you about my dad and how he learned to drive. That's dad in all his 1970s glory. We know it's the 1970s because we scientifically evaluated it. The oil painting of the tiger was the dead giveaway. And that is an epic mustache. That's one of the three greatest mustaches in US history. Mark Twain, Frank Zappa, and my dad. <laughs> dad was a product of the 50s. He was a car nut because in the 50s, cars were mechanical things. We could understand what they were. You could affect them. They had gears, right? They used gravity and things like that. Fundamentally different from where we are now. So around about the 1980s, that magical time called the 80s, I became a teenager and it was time for me to learn to drive. When you need to learn to drive, you need three things. You need a student, and that's me. You need a teacher, that's Pop. And of course, you need a vehicle. You can laugh, go ahead. This is a 1971 Dodge Dart Swinger with a straight six. That was my first car, isn't she a beauty? The most fascinating thing about this car was not that she was mine, but more importantly, that it was an adventure to drive. And by that, I mean I had no idea what was going to happen next. There was zero predictability with this car, right? So you'd get in, and it was always, let's see what happens now. What noise will I hear? What hose will break? What belt will snap? Never really sure what's going on. Now, what was also interesting about it is, as a mechanical device, it didn't really have a whole lot of ways to tell me what was going on. It simply happened. I remember my brother and I were driving to uh, what I didn't know at the time was a surprise party for me, by the way. Uh, I was probably 17 or 18, driving to my dad's house. There's a puff of smoke, a horrendous noise. The car stops dead. I'm on a highway. Okay. Managed to pull off, and I find a payphone. For those of you who don't know what a payphone is, it's like a cell phone that doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> Call dad, and I say, uh, listen, the, the car broke down. What do we do? And he said, well, you know, is it saying anything? Is there an idiot light on? An idiot light? I thought he was calling me names. What do you mean there's an idiot light? He said, that. look at the dash. And is there anything lit up that's telling you what's going on? As it turns out, there's this thing called a check engine light. Everybody familiar with these? You may have seen these before, right? Check engine. That's pretty much all it told me. Check engine. Well, I'm pretty sure the car doesn't work. I'm sitting in it right now. There's smoke pouring from the top. I know something's wrong. I just don't know what. The other thing that was interesting about this is that the light went on after the problem occurred. Now, that's the equivalent of putting the caution sign after you've hit the speed bump, right? Not really helpful in this particular case. But this has been the model for motor vehicles forever, since the 30s. We had these warning lamps, or idiot lights, as Pop called them, because by the time they went off, aren't you the idiot, right? Let me fast forward you 20 years. I've been divorced. I was, like many divorced men, living with family to save some money. This is a Monday evening, and I'm living with my dad, and it's late. And Dad says, you know what, you guys go to sleep. My stomach's a little funky. I'm going to go ahead and sit down on a chair and watch TV for a little while. I'll see you guys in the morning. Okay. Good night, Pop. And we went to bed not thinking about it. And what a difference a day makes. We woke up the next morning to find Dad in that same chair, slumped over, dead. He'd passed away at some point that evening. We don't know how. We don't know why. There was no warning. He was simply here and then he was gone. Now, I don't tell you that story to depress you. I'm not trying to assert either way, by the way, that that story is in any way unique. That same thing plays out every minute of every day, everywhere in the world, as it has throughout human history. We're here, and then we're not. There's usually no warning. It simply happens. But what if? What if we could know? We fast forward another 10 years. I no longer drive a 1971 Dodge Dart. Thankfully, although I think they're running someplace, right? The car that I drive right now is a modern marvel of technology. So my car, German-made car, contains within it something called an ECU, an engine control unit, as well as other uh, computers and sensors. So the car is constantly talking to itself about how it's operating. How are my tires doing? What's the oxygen Within the fuel, is the mixture too rich? Is it too lean? It's constantly making adjustments to the vehicle and its health. My car knows a hell of a lot more about its health than I do. 
in addition, the CCU is also capable of changing things on the fly, making adjustments. You can even reprogram ECUs to build specific types of performance. You want more horsepower? You can tweak the ECU that way. You want more torque? You want this, that, the other thing? You can go ahead and adjust these things from a computer perspective. I want you all to think about something for a second. I want you to think about the last time you saw a healthcare professional. Doctor, nurse, doesn't make a difference. Could be a week ago, could be a month ago, could be a year ago. I want you all to fix that in your mind. And I want you to think about how much health information about you have you exchanged with that person in that time? I see some nodding heads. I'm pretty sure the answer is zero. Will I be incorrect in saying that? Probably not. Why? We simply don't have that infrastructure. We've got a lot of talk about it, but we simply don't have that built yet. So how do you do that? This is what I hear about all the time. Big data. Big data is the future of healthcare. Let me be the first to say, no, it's not. Nor is the future of healthcare an app. So let's kind of get that out of the way right now. They are components of a much larger infrastructure, an industry, not a product. So big data is critically important. When we talk about big data, we talk about four things. We talk about volume, we talk about variety, velocity, and veracity. How much information do we get, or data? Data and information are different, right? How much data do we have? The variety of sources, where is it coming from? In theory, more sources me means better data. Velocity, how frequently do we see this data? Data about a human being every second should be better than data about a human being every year, right? Veracity, how really qualified is this information? Is this good information? Is this good data? Can I do something with it? Maybe, maybe not. So let's talk a little bit about data, and this is how I'm gonna kinda explain why data is not necessarily the, the thing that we think it is. Everybody looks at this and they say, you should at least have a general assumption of what this might be, right? It's a heartbeat, it's a waveform. It's associated with a normal heartbeat, a normal sinus rhythm. Now you've probably seen car commercials where you see this, the eyes dilate, right? And your heart rate you know, picks up and everybody gets very excited. Most people see this and don't realize that there's actually something to this in terms of structure. This means a lot more than you may realize. We look at it and we just see squiggly lines. Everything that occurs here actually means something. Each of these waves is consistent and reproducible, and we expect them to look the same way all the time. We even measure them against each other and against themselves over time, if we have access to that information. The P wave is the first bump of your heartbeat, right? Your atrium depolarizing. The big bump, 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 right? Second beat, it's QRS complex. That's the ventricle depolarizing, pumping blood. And then the T wave is the repolarization. So bump, bump, fill again, bump, bump, fill again. Beat after beat after beat. There's a whole lot more information in those simple waveforms than you may have even realized already. When we look at things like the QT interval, you know, that's supposed to be a certain time frame. If it gets too long, you know what? You could potentially be at risk for a lethal arrhythmia. But until I said that, you had no idea. That P wave, that PR segment, that ST segment that you've seen right now, you know if that raises up, it means you may be having an acute heart attack. If it drops down, you may be having an ischemic event. But until you see that, you don't know. There's a huge amount of information that we can glean. Obviously, we're not gonna read through the slide, but there's a tremendous amount of information that we can pick up from a single heartbeat. Now, generally speaking, a normal heartbeat is gonna be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Generally speaking, assuming that we're all normal, right? Now, let's split the difference. We'll say 80. There's 100 of us in this room. That means that we've, in the minute this conversation's gone on, we've had 8,000 opportunities to look at information about your health, and another, and another. Right? So the question is, is what happens with all this? Where is that data? Data by itself is not necessarily the cure-all that we think it's going to be. It's one component in a much larger architecture. It needs to make sense to people. Right? A system, an industry, is people, process, and technologies. It's not an app. It's not just data. Any more than a car is a steering wheel. It's a component. So I'm going to go ahead and propose that there are four C's to the prevention industry. Clarity, context, communication, and collaboration. What do I mean? Without fluency, without understanding clearly what this information is, and understanding in context, the data in and of itself is essentially useless to me. So contextually, for example, I'm wearing a watch right now that's tracking my heart rate in real time, sending it to my phone. You probably didn't realize that, right? Generally speaking, I run in the 50s in terms of heart rate. Technically, that makes me bradycardic. That's normal for me, but it's not normal according to those typical ranges, right? I'm probably running over 100 right now because I'm giving a TED talk. Now, is that tachycardic or contextually is it, oh, he's on a TED stage? 
Makes a little bit more sense when we think about it that way. But what's the next step to that? How do you make that meaningful? Well, you have to share it. It has to go to people who can make sense of it. And that's where we talk about communication and collaboration. The data in and of itself is a brick. It's a building block to something much, much larger. We need to be able to have constructs that allow us to communicate that information to stakeholders. And there's a lot of different stakeholders in health, by the way. There's patients, there's caregivers, there's care circles, there's payers, there's insurers, right? There's tons and tons of folks that we don't necessarily think of. But how can they all work together in a collaborative environment to achieve better health care? Well, that's where prevention comes in. So right now, one of the things that we talk about a lot in, in health care is fluency how comfortable we are with this information. And this is one of the biggest disasters I think that we've got going on. There is so much information out there on the internet that people have no idea what to do with. Tons and tons and tons of it. Very, very broad brush. Everything you ever wanted to know about Crohn's disease. But how does that affect me? How do I do that? So what we're seeing actually is what happens when you provide data without context. Anybody want to take a guess at what happens? Rampant hypochondria. Why? Because I don't know what this means. Oh my God, my heart rate's above 100. I have tachycardia. I better call somebody. Now, technically that's true, but contextually, does that mean anything? Probably not. But there has to be a process whereby we agree on how we're going to make those decisions, and that's what a prevention industry is. So, what's prevention about? Prevention is fairly simple. What can we know? When can we know it? How valid or real is that information? Who knows it? What does it mean and what do you do with it? Think back about your data. Data doesn't tell you any of these things, does it? Think about your app. Well, that's a single note in a whole symphony of information that we don't necessarily have. I can take a Bach piece and cut it up in individual notes and put it in a bag. It's still technically a Bach piece, but it makes no sense. What are we proposing? Well, we're talking about something called the human API. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the term, an API is an application programming interface. It's a term that technologists use to describe how systems talk to each other. This is how we make system A play nice with system B and system C. Because I can guarantee you they're not written the same way because there are as many different versions of software as there are many people writing them. I happen to be one of those people. All right, so I apologize in advance. So how do you build a human API? When we talk about systems and we talk about APIs, we think in terms of stacks. If this is a new term for you, I apologize. But what we do is we look at the layers that it takes to build a complex system. Right? So a stack is comprised of those individual layers that work together and across to make sense of this, to provide context and collaboration and communication. It begins with stakeholders, the people. We talked about people, process, and technology. These are the people. It's built on the patient and on safety. But there's other stakeholders involved as well, healthcare providers. You can't build a human API information about healthcare without healthcare providers, can you? Nor can you build it without a care circle or payers and insurers or regulators. They're all components of our existing healthcare environment. So how do you start to build something that makes sense for everybody? Well, we start with who? Personalization, let's talk about the patient, let's talk about us as individuals. Personalization, identity, and privacy. Everyone here in this room probably has a different appetite for the information that they're willing to know, share, store. How do you capture that? How do you capture that and also, by the way, protect that? It's a big deal right now, big topic of conversation. Personal health applications and tools. This is your jawbone, this is your Fitbit, this is the website that you use, this is any one of another, you know, $199 uh, pedometers that you strap to your wrist, right? They're out there. We're using them. We're going to see more and more wearables. We're going to see more and more sensibles. We'll talk about sensors in a minute. And of course, data. So we've got people. We've got the ability to collect information. Now we've got data. What do you do with it? This, by the way, is where we are today. We've got tools that create data, and that's pretty much where it stops. You need a whole lot more to integrate to make sense of this. So. First, we need to build health information systems, tech APIs, and EMR. And APIs, again, is an application programming interface. So how do you take the data from all these different places? Because, by the way, every $99 pedometer has its own app. I've got a blood pressure cuff, I've got a heart rate monitor, and I've got a jawbone. They all have their own app, their own data structure. They don't, don't, don't talk to each other. So how do you build an API that allows me to start pulling this together in a way that makes sense for the person? Well, this is where AI comes into play. You know, that may scare some people, artificial intelligence. Computers can process data far better than we can. So this is where we start to say, all right, let's take that information across that broad spectrum. 
Let's roll it up and let's evaluate it and let's look for signals. Let's determine, you know what? Michael has a heart rate of 102. That ticks off a signal. But now what happens to that? Does that automatically send off some alarm? No, it shouldn't, and here's why. Here's where we get into something called human as a service, a medical knowledge cloud. Imagine crowdsourcing physicians throughout the world, throughout the country, who can look at these signals and say, contextually, you know what? I, as a human being, with my tacit knowledge and understanding, can process this information far better than a computer can. It'll send me the broad signal, but now I can look at it, and I, as a pulmonologist, for example, can look at this and say, oh, I see what's the problem. We're okay. Or we're not. We need to do something right away. Behavior and ethics, liability and economics are other components that we have to think about. Right? How do you deal with things like adherence? How do you deal with the payer situation? How does this cover? You know, we could talk about the economic costs of healthcare all we want. There's a thousand other places that you can get better information. I'm interested right now in the human cost of this, right? One in three babies born in the year 2000 will develop diabetes in their lifetime. Seven of every 10 adults in the United States die of a chronic disease. Half of the U.S., 117 million people, are obese. That same number have at least one sort of chronic heart condition, right? Or they've got one risk factor for a chronic condition, including me. Statistically, half of you in this room. Security and compliance, engagement and adherence. So how do we start to build now an infrastructure that lets us say, all right, we've got a whole bunch of stuff, got a whole bunch of data, we're getting it from lots of different places. How do we put it together and make sense of it? How do we then act on it in a way that engages people to do it? And finally, a collaboration space. Because again, without the ability to share this information across the stakeholders, it is essentially meaningless information. Each one of those tiles, by the way, each one of those strata is an opportunity to create entire businesses, sub-industries. I talked to you a little bit about the, you know, that, that uh, human as a service medical cloud. Right? Somebody is going to build those. There's countless opportunities within this human API to create this industry. So what I was going to ask you guys is if you want to help or are looking for help, simply help us advocate, help amplify this message, help connect us to people who are doing amazing things. Thank you very much.